Okay, welcome everyone. Tonight, we're gonna to attempt to do two chapters, chapter 20 and 21, repeated words and code words. So we'll start with the repeated words. And that comes, so usually, when there's repeated words, meaning the same word is repeated twice. So in most cases, it's it, the simple meaning is it's for emphasis. If the Torah wants to emphasize something, it will repeat a word twice. But along with that, there are many, many other explanations of why certain words are mentioned twice. And so we're going to be examining some of these many, many examples. There are many examples in the Torah, in the prophets, in the writings, where words are repeated twice. So the first one that we're going to do is in Parshat Noach. <coughs> so it says, Eilatoldot Noach, Noach, Sadiq. So, uh, I don't have it in front of me. Um, Ela told us, Noach, Noach, he was a tzaddik. So the whole question is, it doesn't, uh, grammatically, it could have just used Noach once. Why, why is it saying Noach, Noach? Now, last time we learned the idea that God called four people by their name twice. But this is not one of the times because God is not talk, calling directly to Noah. The Torah is recording Noah, Noah. So the Zohar has a very, very interesting commentary on what does this mean? And it comes from the meaning of the name Noah. What does Noah actually mean? Noah means to rest. On Shabbos, we call it Shabbat Menucha, the rest of Shabbat. But it comes from the, the root Nun Chet, excuse me, Noach. How did Noach get his name? It actually says in the Torah. It says that his father prophesied when he, when he named him that this one will give us rest from the land that has been cursed. So this goes all the way back to Adam. Noah is approximately a thousand years after Adam. And that whole time, it was considered that the land was, as it were, cursed. Cursed meaning that, that people would have to work very, very hard in order to make a living. According to tradition, Noah created the plow. He invented the plow. And if you, if you go from a person with just a shovel or a hoe in their hand to turn over the earth in order to plant, and you go to a plow that can be harnessed to an animal. So this is giving mankind rest. That's where Noah gets his name. So the Zohar pick, picks up on this idea of rest and says there's a Shabbos above and a Shabbos below, meaning there's a higher type of rest and a lower type of rest. So what does this mean to us? What can we learn from this? We learned that on Shabbos, we get a neshama yatera, an extra level of soul. So here already we have, there are two levels, our usual soul and a neshama yatera, an extra level of soul. And this is translated in the words of, of the Zohar as a, a higher rest and a lower rest. And the uh, Slonim Rebbe, 
in the Tiva Shalom has, has an amazing, amazing insight. And he actually mentions it a few times in his commentary. <clears throat> it's, just, it's a startling thing that he says. He says that if a person keeps Shabbat, according to all of the laws, they're very, very precise and they fulfill all the laws of the Torah, but they do it with no joy. There's no joy in their Shabbat. They fulfill all of the requirements with no joy. So the Son of Marebi says this person will have a portion in the world to come. But this person's portion will be a, a park bench. That's the exact words that he uses. It will be a park bench. What does he mean? Just like a park bench is an inanimate object, it just sits there. So in the world to come, this person, as it were, will be in the world to come, but will be lifeless, will be joyless. Now, obviously, this is an allegory that he's saying, but he's making a very, very strong point. I have to say that uh, Reb Shlomo used to teach us all the time about all of the mitzvot, all of the mitzvot, that you can, you can do all the mitzvot in the most precise way, but if you're doing it without a sense of joy, it's the, 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 the term is tefillah b'li kavana keguf b'li neshama. Prayer without deep intent is like a body with no soul. So he applied this to all of the mitzvah. We can do all the mitzvah, but are they just a body or do they have a soul? So this is alluded to what the Zohar is saying. There's a higher rest and there's a more mundane, lower type of rest. And this is manifest in the two words that actually appear in the Ten Commandments describing Shabbat. One is Shemor, to guard the Shabbat. And the other one is Zechor, to remember the Shabbat. So it's brought down that Shemor, to guard the Shabbat, this is the aspect of keeping all of the halachas of Shabbat. And Zechor, actually the prohibitions, all the things that we can't do on Shabbat, Zechor, to remember, is all of the positive mitzvot associated with Shabbat. So here, we really don't want to make a division because someone could get the wrong idea and say the main thing is the spirit of the law. We don't need the letter of the law, just the spirit of the law. That's not what we're saying. The ideal sense is through keeping the laws of Shabbat, that is the doorway into the higher spiritual, mystical understanding of Shabbat. It should never be a division between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law, between Shemor and Zachor, between guarding the Shabbat and remembering the Shabbat. And there shouldn't be a division between what's called the higher rest and the lower rest. So this is just an example where if we just read the Pasuk, someone could just not even notice that the name Noach appears twice. Or, it, okay, it appears twice, Azma. <laughs> like, what's the big deal? So here's just an example of, of how the Zohar sees the repetition, because that's what we're learning tonight, repeated words. So that's our first one. The next one is on page 187. And this is also a very, very famous one, but it's a little bit different because it's, you'll see it's not the exact same word, but it's the same spelling. And that is the first instruction from God to Abraham 
to leave his, his land and his birthplace and his father's house. Um, and lech lecha, the whole idea is go out of your land, out of your birthplace, out of your father's house to the land that I will show you. So the words in the Torah are lech lecha, which is, of course, the name of that parsha. Lech lecha. These are two different words. One means go, lech. The other one means lecha, to your, literally to yourself. Even though many translators, lech lecha, meaning you go. But when you translate it literally, which virtually everyone does, because that's the deeper meaning here, is go to yourself. Now, if you look at these two words, even lech and lecha have completely different meanings, but the letters are exactly the same. Lamed chaf, lamed chaf. It's, it's the same word twice in a row. It's just because we have different vowels that we read it, lech, lecha. Go to yourself. So this is one of the most famous ones because here we're, we're being told that Avram is, is being commanded to go on a, a, a two-way journey. One is on the literal sense to leave his land and his birthplace and his father's house and go to Israel. But the other one is lecha, go to yourself. Go within yourself in order to finish this journey of self-discovery. The, self, the discovery is not just to discover the land of Israel, but to discover the inner geography, the inner spiritual geography. So I want to take it one step further, though, and we're going to see how this connects to the next one that we're learning also, is one of the dynamics mentioned uh, throughout Hasidut is a concept called Ratso Vashov, running and returning. This is based on the vision of Ezekiel, sometimes called the working of the chariot, Ma'asei Merkaba. And he saw certain angels running and returning. The Gomorrah actually explains where they running to and where they returning. It says that this type of angel very much wants to be in the presence of the Shekhinah. In, in God's divine presence. And so they run towards this, this presence, this vision. And it says they stick their head up as it were over the firmament and they see the glory of God. And they're like in such awe, they run back. It's like too much of a vision. And they like run back. And then it's like, oh, we want to be close again. So they run towards the Shekhinah. But then when they see the vision, they run back. But this is a, 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 an, an allegory in a sense. And this dynamic called Ratsov So this is uh, part of the commandment that God is giving to Avram. He's revealing a very, very deep secret that everything in the universe is running and returning. Lech lecha. Go and go to yourself. So this dynamic we see everywhere. Every time we breathe, it's lech Lecha, every time our heart beats, it's ratso v'shov, run and return. Put your, your, your finger on your pulse, and you can feel the running and returning within the body. Look at the tides of the ocean. They're running and returning. Look at the 
dynamic of every atom, of every cell, of every particle. Everything is in a dynamic motion of running and returning. So one of the beautiful places where this manifests is when Avram comes to Israel. So God said uh, to traverse the length and the breadth of the land. So it says, Yisa Avram haloch v'nasoa hanegma. And Avram, he was not Avraham yet, he was Avram. It says Avram traveled going and coming towards the, the south, the Negev. So here you see, here's your energy again of Ratzov Shav. He, he went and he came. He went the length and the breadth. Avram Now, where we see this in, 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 in a very, very uh, tangible way is when we shake lulav. Everyone can imagine we're holding the lulav in our hand and we're shaking out and we bring it in. We shake it out. We bring it in. This is a manifestation of lech lecha. Lech lecha. It's a very, very uh, deep teaching because usually we don't, we don't relate to Avraham and lech lecha to shaking the lulav. But it's very, very engraved in that whole motion of shaking the lulav. The next one we're going to do is on page 188. This is actually a uh, fairly long uh, piece here, but it's a very, very important piece. This is in Parshat Pikude. That is the last Parsha of the book of Shemot. And again, the words are double. Ela Pikude Hamishkan. Mishkan Ha'edut. These are the accountings of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of witness in English. Ela Pikudei Ha'mishkan, Mishkan Ha'edut. Now I could have said it without repeating the word Mishkan twice. It could have just said, these are the accountings of the Mishkan, period. But it says these are the accountings of the of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of testimony. So many, many people comment on this. And it has to do with the whole nature of the tabernacle, that the tabernacle was considered a microcosm of the macrocosm. This is something that we can't get into now, but there have been hundreds of commentaries that take every single detail of the Mishkan, the colors, the metals, the sizes, the lengths, the breadths, the widths, how everything was put together, how many boards there were, how many curtains there were, every single detail and show that it is the microcosm of the entire universe. And it's also the microcosm of a human being. That is a whole other discussion, but it's learned from the double language of the repeated word of Mishkan, Mishkan. This idea that there's a, a heavenly, now we'll relate it to the temple because we know the Mishkan is the prototype of the temple. And here we see at, um, in the Song of the Sea, for those who are following on page 188, in the Song of the Sea, Rashi comments on this. 
where it says, you will bring them and implant them on the mount of your heritage, the fountain of your dwelling place that you, God, have made, the sanctuary, my Lord, that your hands have established. God will reign for all eternity. So here Rashi comments that the temple in Jerusalem is placed directly below the heavenly temple. And this is just another way of saying that the temple is a microcosm for the macrocosm. But now if we take that one step further, this becomes true of all reality. This is a very, very important idea, is that everything that is happening in the lower worlds is a reflection of higher spiritual principles and realities that are happening. That is almost a given. In other words, our world is a reflection of the upper worlds. Now, the, the big Chiddush, the big innovative idea, it's clear that what is happening down here is influenced by what is happening above. The, the innovative idea, though, is that we below can affect what is happening in the upper worlds. This is one of the most important principles of Kabbalah and Hasidut. This idea, and this obviously is manifest in prayer, where it's not just that we are trying to understand how this world is a reflection, is a mirror image of higher, deeper concepts. This is one of the ways we look at mitzvah. When we're trying to understand what, is, what does this mitzvah mean? Why are we commanded to do it? What's the deeper meanings? So what are we looking for? We're looking for deeper spiritual principles on which this mitzvah is based. The mitzvah can seemingly be very, very tied to this world. And we want to know what, it, what effect does it have by doing this mitzvah? And that's where we look for deeper reasons and deeper spiritual principles that are guiding the meaning of the mitzvot. But the idea, and this is, uh, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge uh, innovative idea that not only are we supposed to uh, plug into what's happening in the upper worlds, but that we can affect it through our actions, our speech, our thoughts, our, and our actions, that we can actually affect what's happening in the upper worlds, which in turn then, of course, affect the lower worlds. So not only are we trying to, let's say, do, make changes in this world, but sometimes the way to make changes in this world is by making changes, as it were, or affecting the higher worlds. And all of this, what I'm saying, is really based on many, many different commentaries. And in, in even Rashi, Rashi himself says this idea of Mishkan, Mishkan the two tabernacles, repeated words, are teaching us something very, very fundamental of how the world works. The next example, and as always, we could go deeper and deeper and deeper, but we want to get through as many examples as we can. So the next one is... Uh, is on the, the bottom of page 191. So this is a very, very interesting one, is in the book of Deuteronomy, 
in, in the, call it the curses in the Parsha of Kitavo. One of the, the worst curses, God says, when Israel is turning away from God and not listening, not doing the commandments, not being good to each other. So it says, Haster astir et panai b'yomahu. I will certainly hide my face on that day. Haster astir. Repeat it. And so it's explained that it's not just a regular hiding. It's a double hiding because the language, it's a repeated word. They say sometimes God is so hidden that people don't realize that God is hidden. In other words, the hiddenness is so <laughs> hidden, we don't even realize that God is hidden. And in the, in the curses, this is considered like one of the worst things that God will hide his face on that day. And so in, in the Talmud, there's a series of questions because our, our premise is that everything is in the Torah. So when they get to the story of Purim, the story of Purim is happening approximately 900 years after the giving of the Torah. But the, but the Talmud asks, where is Esther mentioned in the Torah? Well, you would say, well, what kind of question is that? Esther's not going to exist for 900 years. Why would you expect her to be in the Torah? Well, the answer is, everything is in the Torah. And they ask also, where is Haman? Where is Haman in the Torah? And they ask, where is Mordechai in the Torah? So for Esther, they pick this verse that we're talking about here. Haster astir et panai b'yomahu. I will certainly hide my face on that day. The name Esther come is the same root as hide. The, 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 the Megillah even says that her, her Hebrew name was Hadassah. It was not Esther, it was Hadassah. But we call it the, we don't call it the book of Hadassah, we call it the book of Esther. And she's known throughout the book as Esther. Why is she called Esther? One is because she hid her identity until the key moment where she reveals to Ahasuerus that she is a Jewess and she and her whole people are being threatened with extinction by Haman, she remained hidden. And we also have this idea that in the book of, of, of Megillah Esther, the name of God does not appear. The name of God is hidden. And so the, the Talmud is like, it's like a play on words, but, it's, but what it's saying is that at the time of Purim, God's face was very hidden. His name does not appear in the, um, in the Megillah. And it was not until after uh, the salvation had come that people like looked and said, whoa, look how God was involved in this whole story. We didn't see it. It was hidden. So this is, again, learned from this double language, the repeated language of astir, haster astir et panai. I will certainly hide my face. Okay, so now we're going to the next chapter, chapter 21. This is also a very, very important uh, methodology. 
And it's discussed throughout the Talmud in, in many, many different ways where I used the, the expression code words. The language of, of the Gomorrah is more like any time this word appears in the Torah or this phrase, it means X. In other words, the, the sages wanted to find certain commonalities between the usage of certain words. And so they would take a word and say, anytime this word appears, it means X. Now what you'll see, and this, this happens throughout the Talmud, sometimes there is total agreement and other times, some of the rabbis will say, well, wait a minute. What about this instant in that verse? That means something different. And what about this verse? And then the rabbis will say, no, that's an exception. Or they fit it into their explanation. But the whole point is this idea of code words. So we're going to go through relatively quickly. Many of these you might have heard already, but no matter how many we're going to bring now, there's many, many more examples in throughout tradition. When a certain word appears, it means a certain thing. So the first one we'll do is when, <clears throat> well, we'll do, we'll do, water. That's, that's the first one that's, that's brought here. And it's a simple statement. Now, water is mentioned many times in, in, in the Torah, in the prophets, in the writings. But the sages said, and they don't, there's no argument. They said, anytime the word mayim appears in the Torah, it's an allusion to Torah itself. In other words, as we've been learning since the beginning, Shivim Panim Torah, you read a verse about that has water in it. And it seems like a simple understanding, but the sages were saying you could read deeper into it. It's, it's a hint about Torah itself. What's the connection? Just like nothing can live without water, nothing. Can, we can't live without Torah. Just like all growth, you put a seed in the ground, if there's no water there, it won't grow. So we, we, we relate to Torah in the same way. How can we grow spiritually without Torah? So one of the classic examples is when Yosef is thrown into the pit, Many of you have heard this. Yosef is thrown in the pit, and the verse says, um, Habor reik ain bo main. The pit was empty. There was no water. So Rashi asks a classic question, because we know there's no redundancy in the Torah. That's why we just learned about repeated words. Someone could just say, it's, it's a redundant word. It's a mistake. It's, there's, no, there's no purpose to it. But of course, if it's, a, if it's a repeated word, there's a purpose to it. So Rashi says, why does it say that the, the pit was empty, there was no water? If the, if the pit was empty, we know automatically there was no water there. So Rashi answers a classic way. He says, there was no water there, but there were snakes and scorpions. In other words, when you think of a pit, you think of a pit holding water. So it had no water, but it had snakes and scorpions. So the, the classic interpretation is, if you have a place within yourself, within a community, within the world that has no water, 
what are you going to get? Snakes and scorpions. In other words, a world without Torah is a world of snakes and scorpions. So this is a very um, sharp comment by, by Rashi on that, uh, on, on that verse. Okay, so our, our, our second example is another one with water. This is from uh, Isaiah. And Isaiah says, called uh, same Anyone who's thirsty, go to the water. So the commentaries say, like, what kind of statement is that? Of course, if someone's thirsty, they're going to go to a place where they can have a drink of water. So they say, ah, but that's not really what the, the verse is saying. What it's really saying is anyone who is thirsty for spiritual wisdom, go to the Torah. Yelchul mind, go to the water. So this is just two examples. But the sages say this, this broad statement, any place that it says water in the Torah, excuse, in, the, in the Torah, it's a hint to Torah itself. Now we're gonna do a third one with water, but this is almost like an aside. So we know that Moshe, Moses is named Moshe because Bad Paro said, Min hamayim mishitihu. From the water, I drew him out. In other words, she found him in this little, this little uh, boat little cast, a little uh, floating ark, and she drew him from the water. So quite literally, min hamayim shitihu. So in, in, in Kabbalah and Hasidut, it explains, and this is connected to what we learned last week, if you remember, of the four people that are called by name twice, Moshe, Avram, Yaakov, and Shmuel. Only, only Moshe doesn't have this line, not in the written Torah, but doesn't have this psik between the two names. And so it's, it's explained, what does it mean? From the water, uh, he, he was drawn. So the idea was that the soul of Moshe was coming from such a high place, he was being drawn from the primordial waters of Torah. That's where his soul was being drawn from. He was being drawn from the water. But the water here, <coughs> excuse me, The water here is like the sages said, Ein Mayim El Torah. <coughs> so Moshe being drawn from the water is his soul is intrinsically connected to the primordial Torah. That's why when it says that God spoke to Moshe face to face with no line in between, or mouth to mouth, once it says mouth to mouth, once it says face to face. Because obviously God is the source of Torah, <clears throat> but the way it was coming to Moshe, his soul was so intrinsically connected to that Torah in that high place, there's no line. It was a direct transmission. So here's a third case of Ein Mayim El Torah. And one more that's connected is Yoshua. Yoshua is called Yoshua bin Nun, Joshua. Joshua, the son of Nun. Now in Aramaic, Nun 
It's the name of a letter, but it also means fish. So it could be read Joshua, the son of the fish. So how is that explained? Some say that that simply was his father's name, Nun. Others explain that, that we have this concept that if a teacher teaches a student, it's like they're like a father also. And so who was the greatest student of Moshe? It was Yoshua. And where does a fish live? In the water. So Joshua, the son of Nun, could be translated Yoshua, who was like a fish in the waters of Moshe, or that Moshe, I heard this from Rav Ginsburg, that sometimes Moshe can be called the great fish. Why? Because he was swimming in the waters of Torah all the time. So Yeshua is the son of Moshe, the fish swimming in the water. So here's four different uh, examples of what we're calling code words. Where here water becomes a code word for Torah. Okay, now we'll bring uh, some other examples. And this is from uh, two weeks ago, the beginning of Parshat Ve'era. So it says, um, it says, Vayedaber, Vayedaber Hashem El Moshe, Ve'amar, Ani Hashem. So, but I didn't say it really correctly. Vayedaber Elohim El Moshe V'amar Ani Hashem. So you read this and it's like, what is this verse telling me? God speaks to Moshe and says, I am God. What, what did we learn from this? So first of all, there's two names of God here. The first one is Elohim, and the second one is Yudke Vavke. And this actually is what this the sentence which a lot of people just kind of read over as if nothing happens here is actually one of the deepest verses in the whole Torah. Why? At the end of Ne'ila on Yom Kippur. Now, this is after hopefully 30 days of doing tshuva in the month of Elo. Two days of Rosh Hashanah, the fast day of Song Gedalia, 10 days of Yemei Tshuva, Aserat Yemei Tshuva. You're on the last prayer of Ne'ilah, the end of the fast day, the end of a 40 day process. So, what do we do at the end of Nila? We yell out, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Like everyone in the congregation just yells it out. And then three times, Baruch, Shem, Kavod, Machutal, Le'olam, Ba'ed. And then seven times, really what this verse is teaching us, Hashem, Yudke, Vavke, Hu, Ha'elokim. Yudke Vavke is Elohim. Elohim is Yudke Vavke. This, this is actually one of the greatest secrets in the entire Torah. It's two different names of God. It represents two different energies all together. And what we're saying is, no, it's not two different things. It's the same thing. Hashem Hu HaElokim. That is just an introduction, though, to something else we want to get to, two code words. If you notice, there are two different words for speaking here. Vayedaber Elohim El Moshe, Ve'amar 
Ani Hashem. So the question is, why two different words for speech? So here's one of the code words. The, 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 our sages teach us when it says Vayadaber, it's a language of, we'll call it harshness or gavura. And not in a bad, not necessarily in a bad way, but it's just this is what it is. Vayadaber Hashem El Moshe Lemor. This is what it is. Just Amar is considered a soft language. A soft language. So the question is, and you'll see here, this is also a, a very long piece. It's a very, very fundamental piece. But the, the Ishpitzer Rebbe says like this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it in short so we can get to a few more examples. That the beginning of, of Parshat uh, era is a continuation of the previous Parsha where Moshe says to God, why have you done evil to this people? And why did you send me? And God says, now you'll see what I'm going to do to Paro. And so Rashi brings down this idea that God says to Moshe, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, they, they didn't challenge me like you just challenged me. So he spoke to him somewhat harshly. So why, and then why did, the language changed to Amar, which is a much softer language. So in short, everyone who has the book, please, please read this whole piece, that he was saying that if, if, if God would have come down on Moshe really hard for challenging him, then he would discourage him from challenging him in the future. And God actually wanted Moshe to feel that he could challenge God. And therefore, he changed the language to Amar, a softer language. In other words, it's not explained here, but we have to ask him, why? So I'm giving you one answer. One answer is the greatness of Moshe was that after the golden calf and God said, move out of my way and I'll destroy the people. I'll make a new people out of you. And Moshe says, I'll have nothing to do with this. If you do this, wipe me out of your book. And after the spies Moshe, again, pleads for the people in a way like, I, I, I can't go along with this. You can't do this. And so that's actually what God wanted from Moshe. That's what God sometimes demands from us is to challenge God. Now, of course, this can be misunderstood. This, this was a expression of Moshe's great faith in God, that he could speak his mind, and it would not be taken that he lost faith in him. It was just the opposite. God, I have so much faith in you. I believe that you'll, you'll listen to what I say. You might not agree with me, but you give me the right to speak up. So that's how the Ishpitzer explains this, the change in language. Again, our sages say one language is a code word for a, 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 a more direct, gavura-like response. And the other one is a softer response. Now, the same idea we can use to understand a, a second incident where right before the Torah is given, so... Uh, Moshe goes up and down from the mountain and God speaks to him and says, take this message to the people. And so one of them is that, 
it says like this. This is the bottom of page 197. It says, Moshe ascended to God, and God called to him from the mountain, saying, So shall you say, Tomar, to the house of Yaakov, and relate to the children of Israel, Tagid. So according to tradition, who is the Beit Yaakov? These are the women. And who is the Bnei Yisrael? The men. This is the source of the, the educational system called Beit Yaakov. Women's schools are called Beit Yaakov after this verse. Because by tradition, God was speaking to the women, telling Moshe, speak to the women first with the soft language. Again, this is a code word. It says tomar. It's the same word that we just learned by Moshe. Amar. But speak to the Bnei Yisrael, tagid. Tagid comes from the same word as ligament. And ligament is considered like a, a hard uh, part of the body, the ligament. And so God is saying to Moshe, speak to the women softly and speak more strongly to the men. So the whole question is, why did God want the women spoken to first? So there are many, many answers. One of the answers is, is because as much as we think of men as the main teachers of tradition, it's really the women. It's because what children get in the home, what they get from the, uh, a loving mother, in a sense, is more fundamental than the, we'll call it the book knowledge that is uh, typically associated with, um, with men giving over. That's one explanation, is because the women are, 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 are the foundation of a good Jewish uh, upbringing. And that's why the, the, the word home, by it, refers to the, to the wife, because the, the wife makes the home, and the type of education that is transmitted through the home is, in a sense, more important than what we learn at school. Not that learning at school is not important. Of course it's important. But that kind of uh, education. And the other one that's brought uh, is brought in many, many different places that in the Garden of Eden, so God spoke to Adam and said, don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it was left to Adam to explain it to his wife. And so when Adam told Eve, he said, God said, don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and don't touch it. And according to the Midrash, when the snake approaches Eve, so she says, and he says, why, why, why can't you eat from this tree? Well, God said you can't eat it, eat from it, and you can't touch it, because on the day that you do, you'll die. And so the Midra says that Eve, that the snake pushed Eve against the tree and said, nothing happened to you. What's the problem? And so because God spoke to the man first, so here God is saying, we're going to fix the situation. We're going to talk to the women first. So we don't get things wrong here. So that's a very, it, it sounds a little funny, but it's, it, it's actually saying something very, very fundamental. Adam added something that he wasn't told by God. 
And so God said, go to the women first because they're, they're going to hear it straight. They're going to accept it the way it is. They're not going to add to it in that way. Now, I heard a beautiful teaching from Reb Shlomo about this. And he said like this, he said, where did Adam go wrong when he gave it over to Eve? So he said like this, some, a very, very uh, deep explanation. He said, when he heard from God, don't eat from this tree, that's it. That's the commandment. Don't eat from the tree. And so when Adam gave it over to Eve, he gave it over the same way. Rav Shlomo said what he didn't realize is that he needed to pray over this. In other words, that let's say there's a commandment in the Torah and it's our time to do it. We, we have to realize that we have to pray in order to be able to really relate to it and fulfill it in the deepest way possible. This is not a, a simple concept. In other words, we have to pray over everything. If we do things, it's like, I was told this and I was told that. This is what the Torah says. This is what I'm going to do. And we just leave it like that. We're missing this idea of praying over it. Or uh, a lot of Hasidic masters say a person needs to pray that they are able to pray. Sometimes we just pray because that's what we're, that's what we're told to do. It's time to pray, so we pray. But the, the teaching is you, you have to pray to be able to pray. So Adam didn't realize that in order to give this over properly to Eve, he needed to pray for the right way to do it. He just gave it over, like, this is what you do. So that's just a, a, a very, very... Uh, deep understanding here. And I'm going to end with one last one. One last one is the word vihaya. Now this is one of the ones where the rabbis have a long discussion. But the, the general principle gave over is that when a, a portion begins with the words vehaya, which means and it was. Many people will think, well, that's not such an important word. Vehaya. It's a language of joy. That's what they give over. If, 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 if a, a passage begins or a, uh, a, a whole Torah portion with vehaya, it means it's joy. Now, then the rabbi said, well, what about this verse begins with Vahaya, and that's not very joyous. And what about this one? But they, they, they work it out to this idea that when it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Torah portion. So there are, there are three parshas that begin with, there's two parshas that begin with Vahaya and one passage. And they all have to do with Eretz Yisrael. So what are they? In the book of uh, Deuteronomy, it's Parshat Ekev. And it says, V'haya Ekev Tishma'un. And it will be, if you listen to the words of God, and then it goes on and gives all kinds of blessings. And it's followed by probably the most beautiful and extensive De uh, description of the land of Israel. And many of the blessings are, if you listen, then you will, you will dwell in the land with, with so many blessings. 
That's Parshat Ekev. Vahaya Ekev Tishma'on. Then there's the, the, the Parsha Vahaya Kitavo. And it will be when you come into the land. That's how the Parsha begins. Vahaya Kitavo. When you come into the land. This is obviously talking about Eretz Yisrael. And the other one is the second passage of the Shema. Vahaya Tishma'u which we say twice a day. And there, it's if you listen to the words of God, God says, I will give you the rains in their season and you will, you will live in the land in, in peace and in prosperity. And if you don't listen, then you will be forced out of the land. So all three of these have to do with Eretz Yisrael. And they all... This is what the sages said. If it begins with vahaya, it's the language of joy. Even though it's not mentioned, but they're saying it's a code word for joy. So here we see three different passages about Eretz Yisrael that have the word vahaya. So that most certainly in our day is a very, very important teaching. Because here we are back in Eretz Yisrael, and there's, there's a teaching from the Baal Shem Tov, and with this I'll, I'll end. The Baal Shem Tov says that he was predicting in the future. If you remember, the Baal Shem Tov tried to come to Israel. In those days, that was like practically mission impossible. It took him months to get to Istanbul from Europe. And then on his way to Israel, his ship was pirated and he never made it. He almost died along the way. He never made it. <clears throat> but he already saw that it's time for Jews to come back to Israel. And he used to say, with the same longing that we have had throughout the whole exile, to return to our land. When we do return to our land, we need to maintain the same type of longing even when we're here already. And so that's very, very connected to this idea of joy. I'm speaking to myself and everyone who, who lives in Israel that and everyone out there also, we start to take the fact that we have Israel in our hands again for granted. It's many of us were born into Israel existing already. And it's just a given, but it's not a given. If you look at all of Jewish history, it is not a given that we are in Eretz Israel right now and we are not being um, ruled over not by the Babylonians, and not by the Assyrians, and not by the Egyptians, and not by the Greeks, and not by the Romans. We're not being ruled over. It's not a, a given. So there's a deep, deep connection between maintaining the joy of being in Eretz Yisrael, even, even once we're here, and we're just living, living our lives as if, where else would I live at this point? <laughs> so I want to give everyone a bracha. We'll end with this. That first of all, we should all long to be in Eretz Yisrael. That's a big blessing. It's almost like we were saying before, you have to pray to want to pray. We have to pray to have the proper longing to be in Eretz Yisrael. And then once we make it, we have to pray that we can maintain that kind of longing. But this is a longing of joy. It's like it's Wednesday and we're already longing for Shabbat. Well, that's because Shabbat is so joyous like, I can't wait already. It's, it's Wednesday, but like, I want some of that Shabbos now. 
So we should all be blessed with this kind of longing and this type of joy that comes from Eretz Yisrael.